welcome back. Uh, thanks to everybody for an amazing morning. And I'm glad we got a chance to um, learn a little bit, not just about Arthur Morgan, but about um, some of his children. And I'm um, really excited to be introducing Lee Morgan, who is one of um, Arthur's grandsons. He's the son of Ernest and Elizabeth, and we learned about both of them a little bit this morning. Uh, Lee was part of the planning committee to put this together, and it's been really fun to work together with him. Lee is Arthur Morgan's grandson, the youngest son of Ernest uh, Morgan. He's an Antioch College grad, the first Morgan male to earn a degree, and worked for two years at Matronicaton in India before taking over the Antioch Book Plate Company, which we also heard about this morning. Lee was CEO of the Book Plate Company for about 40 years. He was selected as the Miami Valley Entrepreneur of the Year in 1997. He served as chair of the Direct Selling Association and the Direct Selling Education Foundation, where he was elected to the Circle of Honor. He's a former trustee of Antioch University and chair of the Board of Trustees of Antioch College. He was also a charter member and vice president of the board of the Friends Care Center. He is currently the president of the Morgan Family Foundation, which he co-founded in 2003. For fun, Lee is a soccer referee and plays soccer with other older men and is past president of the Dayton Amateur Soccer League. He now makes his home in Annandale, Minnesota with his wife, Vicki. Annandale is near St. Cloud where Ernest Morgan was born, Arthur Morgan was raised and John D. Morgan, Arthur Morgan's father was the county surveyor. Lee, we're so glad to have you here. And as a reminder, um, yes, yes, indeed. Lee's presentation will be followed by some other, some conversation with some legacy uh, organizations to focus on Arthur Morgan's business ideas. And if people have questions for Lee and the other speakers, if they could put them in the chat as they occur to them. So we'll have a robust discussion at the end of the afternoon. Lee, welcome. Thank you. I was waiting for you to unmute me. I'm not used to having other people mute me. This is quite a, an experience. Okay, I'm going to go directly to screen sharing, provided I can accomplish this. So be a little bit patient with me while I call this up. So, Okay, you should see uh, a thing about how Arthur Morgan was a business advocate and partner. And why I think this is because, as Scott said this morning, the Miami Conservancy District was really made possible by the uh, business community in Dayton, Ohio. And that's the same business community that uh, made the resurrection of Antioch College possible for Arthur Morgan. So he was very, very close to the business community. And in TVA, it's my personal view, and I hope Scott's not on this call because I may be wrong, that one of the reasons he got the heave ho was the difference he had toward the independent power producers and distributors in the, in the Tennessee Valley. Uh, and he viewed them as partners and Lilienthal, his arch rival and successor, viewed them as competitors. And I think that this also indicated his general view of how this should be done. Now, did the slide change for everybody? Good, okay, I worry about the technology. Um, so Arthur Morgan's agenda really was about improving the human condition. And he was unencumbered by formal education. He saw everything as a single system, whether it was an economic system, social system, ecosystem, it was one big system, and he frequently used metaphors from nature to describe uh, the world as he saw it. And particularly when he talked about business, there were big ones and little ones and understory and overstory and mature trees and so on and so forth. And the issue for him was how all of these institutions, all of these systems could improve the human condition. That was his criteria. So the question, what I'm going to talk about today, and this is for the first time, I have not talked about these for a variety of reasons, partly because I've tried to avoid the Arthur Morgan shadow, 
And secondly, because the Antioch Book Plate Company ended up in bankruptcy. So this is the first time in recorded history that I've had a chance to talk about uh, two particular issues. I'm gonna talk about how Arthur Morgan influenced me and what I learned from him about business. And then I'm gonna talk about the rise and fall of the Antioch Book Plate Company, also known as the Antioch Company. We went from 35 employees to 1,200, some $350,000 per year in sales to a million dollars per day. And finally, into bankruptcy and liquidation. And also gonna conclude with what the company did that was most and least influenced by Arthur Morgan. So the two specific ways that Arthur Morgan influenced me were, you know, aside from the usual grandfatherly things, in 1960, I, two months after I graduated, my 17th birthday, I graduated from high school. And in 1960, particularly if you were a Quaker, the draft hung over you. But because I was 17, I had a year before I had to register for the draft. So with $1,500 in traveler's checks, I set off around the world, basically visiting contacts of my family, Arthur Morgan and so forth. And this took me to everybody from E.F. Schumacher in England, the employee-owned companies in England, a variety of folks in Europe, African politician. Many of these were Antioch alums. Uh, co -op, uh, coffee co-op advisor in Tanzania, uh, professors in Karachi. And then of course in India, the vice president of India was a, had become a good friend of Arthur Morgan's. And I visited him and of course the rural universities that he inspired in India. And then I ended up spending two months at Matrana Caton, which was just getting started with this one often. Uh, the second way that Arthur Morgan specifically influenced me was and I, I returned back to Yellow Springs uh, the evening before I started at Antioch College. It, but after four years of Antioch, Arthur Morgan persuaded the Unitarian Universalist Service Committee to sponsor me for two years at Matana Caton. And those two years were, uh, were quite formative for me. Um, I kept the books and I managed a printing operation there. So it was, uh, it was extremely influential in my life. So what did I learn about business, specifically from Arthur Morgan? And in this, I include uh, Matrana Caton. The first was that Arthur Morgan gave work purpose. He said to work without purpose is, uh, is terrible and to work only for pay in my family was described as wage slavery. So purpose is a powerful motivator and having that was important. The second thing about Arthur Morgan was he was a risk taker. He took a lot of risks. We don't talk about them very much. And the key was to have your successes in vats and your failures in test tubes. And Arthur Morgan made a lot of screw ups and we don't talk about those, but I'm aware of those and I very much appreciate them. And the third thing I learned from Arthur Morgan was get good people, trust them, and let them run. The Miami Conservancy District, Antioch College, TVA, none of these were solo acts. They were all dependent on competent people. So let's talk about the Antioch Book Plate Company. This is a good old original building, downtown Yellow Springs. And basically, I got my job the old fashioned way. I inherited it from my folks. And my father gave me his share of the company. And the deal was that I would contribute whatever dividends I received to a charity of his choice. So that was the transaction that ended up with my taking over, uh, taking over the company. So the thing that I think was most unique consistently throughout the history of the company was our board of directors. This is the board of directors of the company in probably about 1950. And in 1950, there were very few women or people of color on boards of directors. And I like to pretend that we were uh, progressive, but in fact, the women and people of color were elected by the employees. It's the employees that were the source of our diversity, not some uh, uh, progressive notion by the management. So as the company grew 
And with these are the very factories we had eventually, uh, Yellow Springs is the upper center factory there. And uh, just for interest sake, Australia is the lower right. So I don't want you to think we're too parochial. But as we expanded, composing the board of directors became a challenge because we wanted to have the majority be non-employee directors. I'm trying to change my view slightly here. So we, uh, this is the board of directors, probably around 2000. And again, the diversity that you can see was all employee elected members, um, but the outsiders, who, those are the ones with the ties and looking very officious, were also actually very diverse. We had uh, Canadian, South African, um, uh, Trinidad. So it was a, a very diverse group. And the way we did it was, as the company grew, every location with more than 100 employees could elect one member to the board of directors, but only two of the staff nominated directors were voting so that the majority vote was with the outside board members. And the way it worked in reality was <clears throat> that I would be making some, uh, some uh, claim about the virtue of the company and what a great job I was doing and how morale was and so forth. And the outside directors would discreetly look at the employee nominated directors to find out just how much smoke I was blowing their way and how much was real. And likewise, when I was making pronouncements about the general economic situation and market practices and business statistics, the inside directors would kind of cast a little eye on the outside director to see if I had any clue what I was talking about. And my experience was that having both inside and outside directors dramatically increased my credibility and the ability to influence the company. In addition, of course, we had, the meetings were all open. We never had executive session. We had some committees that had executive session, but never the board. All the meetings are open. And we would move the meetings from location to location. And then once every three months, I would visit all of our domestic locations and with the local board representative, make presentations to all the shifts of the employees about what was going on. And the highlight of my career of my most fun time was when I got to travel to our foreign locations and talk to them about what was going on. And that was a lot of fun. So, Here's another way of looking at the history of the company. And for those that don't like numbers, uh, you can kind of, this is a nap time. But for those of you who like numbers, this is the nitty gritty. And I view the Ford company in, in phases. And this is starting at the left. The blue bar is the compound annual growth rate in sales. The red or maroon bar is the compound annual growth rate in profits. That's profits after taxes. So you can see the startup period from 26 to 46. This is when the company was a, proprietor, a proprietorship jointly owned by my mother and father. And they had, uh, when you start from zero, you can get some pretty robust growth in there. Look pretty good. Then in 1946, the company incorporated, that's when we started the board of directors, and that was earnest innovation, always having representatives from the employees. You can see that while there was pretty steady growth, it was minimal. Then in 1968, I took over the business and things got pretty grim. You can see that our sales continued to rise just a little bit, but in fact, we were losing money. And one of the problems with taking over a company uh, from your father is that you have a different skill set. So where Ernest could operate every machine in the place, I couldn't operate any of them. And he tended to underpay people. And they worked there because they were kindred spirits. They were conscientious objectors, refugees, uh, social activists of one sort or another. And when I came in, one of the first things that I did was to raise wages to roughly market level, which is about a 25% increase that threw us into a profound loss. The outside directors quit. Um, anybody who had stock was selling. Uh, Hardy Trollander, the head of YSI, discreetly approached my father and asked him to brace himself for the collapse of the company. 
The employees called Ernest, who was now living at Silo, North Carolina, pleaded with him to come back and he declined. And it looked pretty grim, but we got two new outside directors. One was Ken Champney, co-owner of the Yellow Springs News and a, a conscientious objector. And um, the Antioch Book Plate had at one point owned the Yellow Springs News. And the other was George Asakawa, who became my mentor in both business and philanthropy. And George came to Yellow Springs to visit his brother, Moto Asakawa, who was working at the company uh, before and immediately after World War II when they had hired Japanese uh, Americans from the relocation centers. And George came and visited Moto and ended up getting a job at Vernet Laboratories where he became uh, president and CEO. And I think he was also chairman of the local bank. And they came on the board and I would present my plans to the board to break even and turn it around and so forth. And George invited me to his office and we had a, an epiphany for me. He said, Lee, the idea is to make money. If you plan to break even, you're gonna lose money and the company is gonna collapse. And I said, wow, you know, that's an interesting concept, the idea of making money. So I went back to the company, I violated a fistful of social contracts and fired 30% of the employees, a third of the employees in a small town. It was made a little easier because of our board of directors. Everyone knew the situation was pretty dire. But after that, sales took off, profits took off. And we went through a good solid 13 years of double digit growth in profits compounding it was really good. And then in the mid 80s, and by the way, we made our money selling accessories to bookstores, bookmarks, book plates, some children's books, journals, calendars. But by the mid 80s, the independent bookstores were taking a beating. Bookstores were consolidating, chains were coming in, and our sales weren't going anywhere. And one of our customers suggested we look at buying a bankrupt photo album company in St. Cloud, Minnesota. So, you know, we were looking for ways to diversify. So I went to St. Cloud with one of my colleagues and we ended up buying the Holes Webway Photo Album Company. It's a long, complicated story, but the bottom line is we paid $1,400 so that I could be CEO of a bankrupt company. And when I went to work every day, the question was, is he, is he a crook or just stupid? And, uh, but from that, album company sprang up Creative Memories. And that was basically the sale of photo albums like Tupperware in home parties. And then our sales and profits exploded. When you have nine years of a compound annual growth rate of sales of 27% and profits of 57%, uh, you're really rocking. So that's where we took off. The next phase of growth actually was bankruptcy. And I'll deal with that one a little later. The mission statement for the company uh, morphed a bit over time, and this is not mandated. This is something that evolved uh, sort of organically. This is roughly 2000. And this is sort of vintage Arthur Morgan that said the mission was to serve human needs by making a difference in the way people remember, celebrate, and connect, and to maintain a community of work that offers opportunities to prosper and inspires hope for the future. To support that mission, we also had very specific uh, values. And here you'll see our definition. This is the working definition we had inside the company of our community of work. And we define a community of work as being characterized by three principles, common purpose, demonstrated, I emphasize demonstrated values and shared outcomes. And then we had these four values and for each of these values, we had lists of behaviors that we felt supported these. And if anyone is interested in getting these, uh, Susan Jennings has a copy and I'm sure she would be glad to, to share that with you. Um, so that was, that was very important. So in uh, 1979, we initiated or I initiated employee ownership and it was fabulously successful. 
We started it for two reasons. First, we had no retirement plan. And when you take over a company that's, uh, you know, started in 26, you've got a lot of older folks with uh, no retirement plan. And secondly, we were growing and we needed capital. And the ESOP allowed us to issue new stock to the ESOP and deduct the value of that stock from our income tax. So the stock went into accounts for each employee and it reduced our tax burden, providing capital with which we could buy printing equipment. For those of you that have no way of knowing, printing is very capital intensive. That is the investment per worker is relatively high. Well, the ESOP, was uh, a wild success. Um, we, uh, we were sort of the darling of the ESOP community. And at one point, I made a comment to my father that any employee who had been in the company 15 years, regardless of income level, was a millionaire. And it was one of the rare times that Ernest snapped at me. He was disappointed. He said, that was not the idea. We were not in this to make people rich. We were to be a community of work. The irony was we were making the money. Somebody had to get it. And this is just a chart we had in, uh, it was roughly 2004, that shows the number of participants in the balances. So we had in 2003, 48 people with over a million dollars. However, in 2004, we paid out uh, roughly 100 million in distributions, and it reduced the number down to 24. But the point at is that we were making a lot of money, and the employee ownership was wildly successful. Then in 2003, we became 100% employee owned. Up until 2003, all of the stock in the ESOP was newly issued stock, diluting the family share of the company. And it had approached 50%. And in 2003, for a variety of reasons, which I would be glad to recap, but in the interest of time, I'm going to ignore, we became 100% employee owned. Basically, the company bought back the stock from non ESOP stockholders, and the largest of whom were myself. It valued the company roughly $245 million. And we were paid, the outside shareholders with significant portions were paid one-third cash, one-third notes, and one-third in options to buy the stock back in 10 years. And it was that cash coming to Vicki and I that funded the Morgan Family Foundation in 2003. And just for the heck of it, there are some familiar words. This is the purpose of the Morgan Family Foundation, which came out of the sale of our family stock to the company. And the foundation's purpose was to, to uh, uh, the purpose is to improve the human condition. This is a very familiar refrain for people that work with Arthur Morgan. And we narrowed this down further to four focuses, social equity, global warming, end of life issues, and encouraging uh, philanthropy. So I love talking about operations. Um, one of the things that we did was we focused on continuous improvement. And we, when you have an employee-owned situation where you're making a lot of money, people are eager to improve. And we implemented something called demand flow manufacturing. It cut the lead time to make albums. We could say, if we needed 100 photo albums, it went from two weeks to 20 minutes. We filled our orders in about four hours and we had three of our factories located in UPS hubs. So a typical order would be delivered the next day, the kind of thing that we now take for granted from Amazon. We became a destination site for the Association for Manufacturing Excellence. And here is the key. For every doubling of our sales volume, I look for a 25% reduction in our product unit cost. This was what I call the secret sauce. That is, we kept driving our costs down, improving the quality and service. And for proof of this, I love Walmart. They tried to buy the albums from us, but because we were selling them in home parties like Tupperware, we didn't want to have retailers competing. So we refused to sell to Walmart. So Walmart went to China, took the album to China and said, knock off this album. 
And they did. They brought them in. And I'm pleased to report that they were inferior quality wise and they were more expensive. And I credit this to a culture of continuous improvement. And to facilitate this, we had four operating imperatives in order. And if you worked at the Antioch company, you were expected to know these and to know the order of these, imp these imperatives. And number one was safety. We took this very seriously. We met about this regularly. If you got hurt the company, it was, there was hell to pay. Quality was number two. Number three was delivery. And cost containment was, uh, what was the last of them. And uh, these are vital to having continuous improvement. So these, are, I, I just think I, I'm giving away company secrets, but fortunately we went bankrupt. So who cares? Meanwhile, we were making a lot of money and we started putting it into a company foundation. And we got to do some interesting stuff in that foundation. We did the usual matching programs. We had cause related marketing. Cause related marketing is when a company picks what they think will be a popular charity and they adopt it as their own. Popular charities would usually be children. In our case, since our mission was preserving, enriching and inspiring memories, we adopted Alzheimer's, so we gave them a lot of money. We gave employees paid time off to do uh, volunteer work. And the program I was most proud of that the foundation did was a social justice program called Just Living. We plagiarized this from a Catholic church in uh, Louisville, Kentucky, and we secularized it. They claimed that was impossible. And we had uh, it reviewed by actually Antioch College professor who was of Muslim extraction and to make sure it was secular. And it was a six month program. We rolled it out. People met one day a week for six months. And I think we probably had a higher participation rate than the average Catholic church. All of our factories participated. And interestingly enough, it outlived the company slightly. Uh, the foundation cash ended up in a community foundation and financed this. What required money was updating the social justice materials and a small stipend to the facilitators. And when the foundation money ran out, the program ended, much to my regret. This is the uh, brochure promoting the Just Living program. Now, our factories were very ethically different. So for me, it was exciting to tackle the you know, social equity issues in plants with such a wide variety of uh, demographics as we had. And I'd love to go on and on about this, but I think I need to get down to the bankruptcy, to the dark side of our history. So what happened? Well, in 2005, those doggone camera phones came in and started to change the way that people shared and saved their photos. And in 2005 was the first year we had a sales drop. They went down a little over 7%. Meanwhile, we had huge liability to pay out to the employee owners as they retired. As I mentioned, in 2004 alone, we paid out 100 million. Now, something else was happening in 2008. Banks were panicking. This was, the, uh, this was the Great Recession. And they got nervous about our repurchase obligation. And they said to us, if you pay the retirees before you pay us, that is the banks, they were going to be unhappy. But we paid the retirees. The banks did get unhappy. They seized our cash and put us into bankruptcy the sole purpose of eliminating the ESOP and the ESOP repurchase liability. Ironically, in 2008, including the bankruptcy costs, we didn't lose money. So what happened after we went into bankruptcy? Well, the banks took over the board of directors. They brought in workout managers. And five years later, they went into a second bankruptcy and liquidation. The remnants of the company were purchased by one of our vendors out of Hong Kong and the company has been restarted. So Creative Memories is back up and running, but on a much smaller scale. So what did the, what did the company do that was most and least inspired by Arthur Morgan? 
most inspired, I have to look at what we call the Ernest Morgan Institute. This was our effort to uh, become a learning organization, it involved everything from diversity training to skills training to outside education, all sorts of things. But one of the things that we did that is the one that I credit Arthur Morgan the most for, we sent three groups of employees to Medtronic Caton. This is all company paid. They were on company time. People from all of our different factories applied to go. And for many of them, this was a life-changing experience. Uh, a couple of them were traumatized because they were uh, pretty evangelical Christians and they found it uncomfortable being in a totally Hindu environment. But when they came back, many of them undertook to raise money for Matronic Caton. And then, of course, the company foundation matched any money they raised, and the Antioch company became a significant funder of Matronic Caton. And so I, I credit this as being the thing that Arthur Morgan had the most influence on, or at least I'm proudest of that I think he influenced. Least influenced, well, I like to celebrate. At, at my heart, I'm a party animal. On the left, that's me in the middle there of the three. And on the right, we did a lot of dancing. I like to dance. We did a lot of dancing and we took celebration very seriously. We would bring in busloads of our consultants as we called our salespeople. And when they would arrive, they would be greeted by 30 or 40 employees out applauding them as they got off the bus. And the pinnacle of our celebrations were our annual sales meeting. This is the close of our annual meeting, probably about 7,500 people in the Minneapolis Convention Center professional meeting planners, professional entertainers. We're just hooping it up and having a good time. So this is what I think I'm proudest of, but I can't credit this to Arthur Morgan. However, I don't wanna leave the impression that Arthur Morgan did not like a good time. Now it's true, I never saw him dance. Frank, I don't think I ever saw him tap his foot to music. But in 1967, while I was at Matronic Caton, Arthur Morgan made his first and only visit to Matronic Caton. Now, this took a little bit of guts because at the time he was 87, there was no electricity, no running water, no telephone at Matronic Caton, and this was his first visit. And I thought that was pretty gutsy. To complicate life, he had a film crew with him who were filming for the I See a Village film, which has been shown periodically. Now, having these cameramen around did not go unnoticed by the students in the school. So here you can see the student has rigged up his own camera and is filming a variety of things. And of course, Arthur Morgan got into the flow. So here you have Arthur Morgan doing a mute interview into a coconut husk in front of a camera made of waste baskets and tapioca stems, very animated conversation. And here you have the same conversation being filmed by a professional uh, cameraman at the same time that this gorilla, this, this impromptu gorilla theater is happening in Arthur Morgan was uh, very much in the flow. I'm sorry you can't see the coconut husk that he was uh, talking to. So that, uh, whoopsie, I'm getting confused. So any questions, that concludes the materials that I had prepared.